to welcome you to um, this afternoon's Wednesday lecture. Before I begin, I want to thank Karen Ehrman of NIAID, who's done the Yeoman's job of nominating today's speaker. And, and she did the work of organizing her day. And so um, all the credit goes to Karen for organizing today. Um, Dr. Batia, welcome. She embodies the convergence of the physical, the clinical, the life sciences. Just by simply her academic affiliation, you will, you, she is professor of health sciences and technology and electrical engineering, computer science at MIT, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. She's an MD, PhD, and she, among many, many awards, I want to point out the one by the Packer Foundation. She is one of 100 most innovative young investigators worldwide. So that's a wild selection. And, and, and with that, I won't take up much more time. We have an exciting lecture before us. The title of her talk is Tiny Technologies and Medicine. Um, welcome to the podium, Dr. Batia. I'm going to rearrange a little here. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I wanted to really thank uh, the NIH for the warm invitation, and Karen especially, for organizing everything. And uh, Rod, it's great to see you well and uh, here today. So <laughs> hello. Um, so I'm going to um, just get started and tell you about our interests. So in our group, we're interested in how communities function. And the way we think about it, communities are composed of a number of individuals that have a collective behavior or identity. And they're characterized by an interdependency between the individuals. The individuals, in turn, are influenced by their environment. And therefore, the behavior of an individual, as impinged upon them by their environment, can impact the behavior of the community for better or for worse. And we know that there are communities, actually, at many length scales, and there are whole disciplines dedicated to the study of how these individuals interact to have a collective function or behavior. So at the level of a number of individuals that display some interdependency, we think about sociology. And if we think about within a particular individual, the interdependency of different organ systems, when things are going well, we think about physiology. And when things go awry, we think about pathophysiology. If we go all the way down to the length scale of a single cell and we think about interacting pathways as they impinge on the cell as a whole, we have the field of cell biology. But I would argue that there's perhaps a knowledge gap at the level of the tissue microenvironment where we think about numbers of individual cells of different cell types interacting with each other in an environment composed of extracellular matrix organized in a three-dimensional fashion. Uh, and that is actually the interest of our group. So we're interested in tissue microenvironments, both in healthy microenvironments and how to build healthy microenvironments. And today I'll be telling you about liver microenvironments. And we're also interested uh, and how these microenvironments can go awry. Um, in particular, I'll be talking about cancer microenvironments today and how one could interrupt that process. The tools that we've been interested in leveraging are the so-called tiny technologies, which I'll outline for you in the next couple of slides. We've been interested in this idea of taking the technology that drove the computer revolution, and that's this simple process known as photolithographic patterning or photolithography, and over the course of 50 years, engineers, material scientists, and physicists made us able to, to go from a single transistor on a footprint here to over 100 million. So you can just imagine the power of miniaturization um, and how far it's driven us with regard to information science. And we and others have been thinking about how this might be useful in medicine. So if one looks at the analytical domain, 
there are, of course, many examples of how these types of tools might be useful for improving analytics. So there's the so-called top-down approach of taking a large substrate and microfabricating smaller and smaller parts on it using derivatives of that process that I showed you, photolithography. And that's enabled creations of, of this kind here. This is a microfluidic chip that's driven by capillary microelectrophoresis and it, uh, performs complex um, laboratory operations on a chip. Here, this is a stepwise process that allows one to build DNA microarrays. And these technologies, these so-called top-down microfabrication technologies are getting smaller and smaller. So they're actually approaching the nanoscale. Elsewhere in the field, largely coming from the field of material science, we have so-called bottom-up methods of microfabrication or nanofabrication. And here, for example, I'm showing you solution phase assembly of things like quantum dots, which are very sensitive biosensors in this assay. And many groups are working on how one can then assemble these nanoscale materials to approach the microscale from the so-called bottom-up. So these are sort of the tools, this is our universe of tools that I'm interested in exploiting to study the microenvironments that I talked about earlier. And in particular, we're interested in studying them in three different ways. So the first I'm showing here is we'd like to be able to build microenvironment, build complex tissues of different cell types in two and three dimensions for therapeutic applications. We're also interested in making arrays of microenvironments. So here these are cells that are arrayed in a pattern, which is very achievable with microfabrication techniques, and studying the population, so using these kinds of tools to interrogate these microenvironments in parallel. And finally, we're interested in making materials and systems where one can interact with these microenvironments and perturb them, for example, with drugs or with viruses. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my example about the liver. Um, this is a liver microenvironment, and I know some of you are liver biologists in the crowd, so I won't spend too long on this slide, but um, suffice it to say that the liver, when um, it's working well, has many, many functions, 500 plus functions, which we typically bin into four main categories depicted here. And liver disease uh, impacts about, uh, it causes about 40,000 or more deaths in the US every year. There are limited treatment options. Basically, the gold standard is whole organ transplantation, and of course, there's a, a shortage of donor organs. So we and others have been interested in ultimately engineering implantable liver tissue to help these patients. And our approach to this process is shown here. So as I mentioned before, we're interested in constructing uh, hepatic microenvironments, ultimately for therapeutic applications. We've also been interested in making tiny pieces of liver tissue in arrayed platforms to interrogate how the structure function relationships of the liver work in vitro. And finally, we've been interested in studying how the liver interacts with perturbagens here, for example, hepatitis C virus. And ultimately, our hope is in doing this again that we'll come up with tools and therapies to impact our patients. So I'll start with the main challenge in the field historically, which is this. So if you're gonna make a cell-based therapeutic and the central core of your therapy is the hepatocyte, the factory that does these 500 functions, you need to maintain its phenotype. And we know that when we isolate hepatocytes from their phenotype, from their microenvironment in vivo, they rapidly lose their phenotype. So this is just one of the 500 functions that I described to you, albumin secretion, but this is true of virtually any function that one examines in vitro. These hepatocytes are plated in two dimensions on collagen type one. And you can see that um, as they undergo this process, they become fibroblastic. They undergo something like an epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and they're not useful for therapeutic applications. So in the early 80s, this observation was made by a French group, the guggen gioza group, and we call this the co-culture effect. And what's, what we're, I'm showing you here is that one, one adds non-parenchymal cells from the liver um, to these cultures, one can see at least a transient rescue of this phenotype. And this observation was originally made with cholangiocyte-like cells, so the cells that line the bile ducts of the liver. And over the course of the 80s, the guggen Giozos and others showed that actually many other non-parenchymal cells of the liver would support function of hepatocytes in this way. 
And then through the 90s, it was shown that actually many other mesodermally derived cells that were not in the liver, and even across species, could perform this function. So um, a variety of groups have argued that this teleologically actually is um, a, a moment, is probably a developmental program um, that we are triggering where hepatocytes are, the liver is specified, and there's an endodermal mesodermal interaction in uh, the embryo. Um, and perhaps that's why we're seeing this robust effect across so many cell types. So regardless, we were interested in studying this many years ago and developed this photolithographic method that we've um, been using to study this further and um, optimize these systems. So in this slide, what I'm showing you is the same photolithographic process I described for making computer chips applied to cell culture. And here what we're doing is patterning glass wafers with extracellular matrix, this is collagen type 1, in spots of different diameter size. And what happens is this confers the adhesion of hepatocytes in single cell islands and larger and larger clusters. And one then can then surround these cells with non-parenchymal supportive cells. And for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be talking to you about a mouse fibroblast cell line that we've found empirically provides the most function in our model system. So what one, what one is able to do then using this technique is maintain the same number of cells, the same ratio of cells, and simply change the architecture and ask questions about how they behave as a collective, as a function of this. And what we see in the system is that we can optimize their functions. So this here is the data for the rats, rat hepatocytes in this species. And that there are species-specific differences. So for example, if we look at human hepatocytes, they have an optimal colony size, wherein they like a certain amount of homotypic or self-contact, as well as heterotypic contact. And furthermore, if one looks at the dynamics of these cultures, one sees that one can not only rescue not, not only tune the level of liver-specific functions that one finds in these tissues, but one can prolong the lifetime of these tissues and culture. So these rodent systems now that were transiently rescued before are stable for about two and a half months, and the human ones for about four to six weeks. Okay, so we then got interested in studying the dynamics of this interaction. And for that, we invented this uh, reconfigurable cell culture chip, which is made out of silicon. And the way this part works is this is a set of interlocking combs. We spin coat it with polystyrene, and we can plate two different cell types on these moving parts. And they click together in two modes. This is what we call contact mode, and this is what we call gap mode. And in gap mode, these two cell populations are separated by an 80 micron moat, so they never touch. And what that allows you to do is separate short-range soluble signals from contact-dependent signals. And then because the part is made in this way, you can click back and forth between the modes, or one can come in sequentially with different stroma if one wanted to, for example, mimic a developmental process. So typically when one does this in the microfabrication world, these would be actuated uh, by, a three, by a robot. And the postdoc doing this work, Elliot Hui, who's now on the faculty at UC Irvine, made several design features so that one could simply um, move this manually in a biological safety hood just with the um, end of a pipette tip. Okay, so now you can see you can separate these cell populations and you can go on to do your molecular analysis. So what have we learned using this technique about our co-culture effect? The first thing we learned was that contact was required. So if I just walk you through this plot, what we see of hepatocytes alone on one set of combs lose their phenotype as I showed you before. And when they're in contact with their supportive stromal neighbors, they're rescued. If we culture them 80 microns apart in the same culture dish under the exact same conditions and they are never allowed to touch, it's as if they had no supportive neighbors at all. What's perhaps more interesting and surprising to us is that there's a dynamic component to this. So in this experiment, what we've done is we've allowed them all to touch. We've allowed the cells to interact for 18 hours. And then we do the following manipulation. So in this case, what we do is we remove the stromal cells completely. We put them in another dish. And you see that those cells, in spite of having 18 hours of contact, are not rescued. And furthermore, if you take these cells and you add conditioned media from a stromal uh, well, you, they're still not rescued. However, if you switch from contact mode after 18 hours to gap mode, so that they can now receive short-range paracrine signals, 
we stain the cultures, we see that short range is about 350 microns, you can see that they're completely rescued. So this feeder layer effect that we and others observe in many systems seems to have a short range, a, a, a temporal component that's contact dependent and a longer range component that's dependent on paracrine signals. Now for us as engineers, that's very exciting because this starts to look like one might be able to replace the fibroblast with something like a coating and something like a media additive. Okay, so just to summarize what we've learned about the system so far, Organization impacts the emergent or collective tissue function. We know that many stroma are supportive, that there's a temporal component. I won't walk you through um, all of the transcriptomics that we've done, but we know several proteins that these fibroblasts are making that we think are important. And so far, no single one of these or combinations of these actually produces the full rescue effect. And I think there are several interesting implications. So commonly in cancer, we think about stromal cells or cancer-associated fibroblasts actually driving an EMT progression. But in this case, I think what's interesting is that the fibroblasts are actually preventing an EMT. Um, so uh, it suggests perhaps that normal stroma may actually serve a role in rescuing from EMT, which is really not what we normally think about. It tells us that there's a dynamics of cell-cell interaction that's important to many of these, I hope, many of these feeder layer effects. And that some of these secreted proteins, we believe, are not just potential media additives, but potentially have therapeutic applications as hepatoprotectants. Okay, so we're still sorting through how this system works, but can we use it in the meantime? So we wanted to think about how it might be useful for studying aspects of liver disease that weren't previously tractable and that were human-specific. So we re-engineered this a couple of times, and the latest version of this should look to you like a boring old 96 well plate. Uh, however, within each of these wells, you see that there are micro-patterned hepatocytes, so there are collagen uh, spots that have conferred the adhesion of human hepatocytes in this 500 micron circle. So there's 250 hepatocytes on each of these islands, and they're surrounded by these supportive fibroblasts and they're spaced at the optimum spacing that we defined for human hepatocytes. You can see in this configuration that they're beautifully polarized. I don't know where Wynn is, somewhere. <laughs> we were talking about polarity earlier. Um, and if you add a dye that's excreted into the um, apical domain, you can see that they light up a nice biocanalicular network, which if you're a liver aficionado looks a lot like a chicken wire network between hepatocytes. If you do a confocal staining here of polarized transporters like MRP2 and ZO1, you see a nice polarization of the cells. Okay, if we look at some of the secreted markers, the cells are rescued for about four to six weeks. So as I mentioned earlier, there's 500 liver-specific functions, and so I'm not going to walk you through our characterization of all of them, as this work is published. Um, but I will say that the detoxification activity of the cultures is rescued and that we've looked extensively, started to look extensively, at how these uh, cells interact with drugs, so medicines, that the liver normally metabolizes. So one can do experiments looking at hepatotoxicity, um, both acutely and chronically. And I think it, chronic toxicity in particular is very interesting because that's how we take all of our medicines, at low doses in a daily format. One can look at drug-drug interactions. So here is a classical interaction between acetaminophen or Tylenol and phenobarbital, an anti-seizure medicine. And then if one makes these in vitro model systems out of different species, one can see recapitulated um, known induction responses that have a species-specific pattern. So these are drugs that are known to induce P450s in humans and not in rats at the level of the organism. And again, we see them here in this model system. So what else can one do other than query these with, um, with small molecules? We started thinking about what diseases had been uh, difficult to study due to uh, potentially inadequate model systems. And one that was very interesting to us was hepatitis C virus. So um, as many of you know, this is an enveloped RNA virus. It's hepatotrophic. There's over 170 million people chronically infected worldwide. There's no vaccine. And current therapies, at least in North America, are only about 50% effective. So we could start a collaboration with Charlie Rice at Rockefeller University. We wanted to see if we could use this platform to in develop a persistent infection model of hepatitis C virus in the authentic host, the human hepatocyte, 
um, and also see whether we could do it in a way that would be amenable to high throughput assays. So I'm going to show you two examples. So um, the first is an entry assay that we developed. So these are uh, pseudoparticles. So these are retroviruses that express GFP that are decorated with the viral proteins E1 and E2. And the idea is that when they infect a cell that expresses the receptors, the cell lights up green. And the thinking was is that this is an automatable assay for viral entry inhibitors. So the first thing that we needed to do was check our cultures to see if they expressed in the appropriate location the known entry receptors for HCV. So here you can see CD81 staining, SRB1, scavenger receptor B1, Clodin 1, and occludin 1. And interestingly, uh, these are uh, polarized in the normal human hepatocyte and not polarized in the cell lines that um, are really the workhorse of the field, the so-called Hue 7.5s. So if one now looks at um, how these HCV pseudoparticles infect the micropattern co-cultures, you can see an image like this here. So there's about uh, three cells in this image lighting up green. And we can use this assay with antibodies against the cognate entry receptors and show dose-dependent inhibition here, for example, with antibodies against CD81. And when one uses a pseudoparticle decorated with the uh, bacillivirus, protein, one does not see that. So using this assay on a fluorimeter readout, we were able then to score several antibodies that are in the pipeline that are being developed clinically to prevent reinfection of transplanted livers. Um, so we think this is a nice potential way to, to, to really be able to screen a, a wide variety of entry receptor inhibitors. So the next thing we wanted to do was develop an assay for replication. So here again, we partnered with Charlie's group, and this is um, a version of HCV genotype 2A. It's a cell culture adapted version of Japanese fulminant hepatitis 1, and it's a reporter virus. So every time the viral genome gets translated, we get the secreted Glaucia luciferase in the media, and we can just sample the media and put it on a luminometer, and again, get an automated readout. So here what we've done in this experiment is inoculate the system, allow the virus to replicate, so now you're seeing luminescence come up in the media, wash, you see it recover, and so on and so forth. So we see persistent infection, this was published just last year, of these cultures. Um, we've improved this considerably since the paper was published. We now routinely get about three to four weeks of persistent infection. And you can see in this experiment, if you add protease um, or polymerase inhibitors or treat with interferon alpha, you can see that this is a specific response. Okay, um, and then it's just to show that this is difficult to do in uh, other model systems. Okay, and so then finally one can now take uh, candidate drugs and look at dose-dependent um, inhibition of uh, tran viral translation. And I think what's potentially interesting about the system here is one can start to now look in vitro at combination therapies, which most folks think are going to be required for effective HCV therapy just as they are for HIV therapy. Okay, so what are we doing next with this now that we have the system working? One question that we're interested in is why so few cells are infected. So we only see about three to five percent of the hepatocytes in that colony infected. So together with Charlie's lab, we've developed a method for laser capture microdissection and a live cell reporter of which cells are infected with HCV. We're starting to be able to look at the transcriptome of the infected cells as compared to the others. We're interested in how the virus spreads. So there are reports in the literature of a so-called CD81 independent spread, where the virus would spread between cells without going out into the extracellular milieu, and that has a lot of therapeutic implications. So we've, together with Alexander Van Udendarden in physics at MIT, we've developed this uh, single molecule fish technique, which is uh, depicted here, where you have multiple probes that line up on the viral RNA, and you're able to basically count single viral genomes um, in infected cells. So here we're counting genomes in Hue 7.5s, but we hope to be counting them in, again, the primary human hepatocytes. We're interested in the role of innate immunity. Um, so for example, if we inhibit innate immunity with uh, measles V protein or JAK inhibitors, we see boost in function in the system. And this is very interesting because human hepatocytes, of course, have a competent innate immune axis. And the immortalized cell lines that most people grow them in have a missing innate immune axis. So now we feel like this is an opportunity to study this. We're interested in the role of polarity, so we know that the cells are differentially polarized across this island, and we see 
uh, differences in infection and entry um, that we think may correlate with the polarity of the cells. And then finally, we're interested in how HCV might compare to other pathogens, and I don't have time to tell you about this today, but this is a malaria sporozoite swimming in one of our cultures. And we've now established the liver stages of Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, which um, both infect the liver on the way to the blood. Um, and we're very interested in adapting this model for both vaccine validation and drug development. Finally, then, we're interested in how one can model genetic variation. So what I've told you about are typically responses from a single host across many wells, and one might think about trying to model personalized liver responses. And an approach to doing that, then, would be to use induced pluripotent stem cells. So in collaboration with Stephen Duncan at the University of Wisconsin, we've adapted his directed differentiation protocol, which allows one to make 80% of a culture into what I'll call hepatocyte-like cells when we phenotype them, as shown here. I'm actually not sure how these fluorescent micrographs are projecting, but we can see that um, they um, turn on uh, in a directed differentiation program many mature hepatocyte-like functions, so here albumin, but you can see that they also retain some alpha fetal protein expression, which is a fetal liver gene, and several fetal P450s. So we think that they're equivalent to about a 32-week gestation hepatocyte. And we're just now starting to micro-pattern micro them in some of our in vitro systems to ask the question um, about whether one can more fully mature these cells in these in vitro microenvironments, because the field has really been stuck at this sort of 32-week time point. And this may allow us then to make personalized livers that um, represent the phenotype of patients of interest. Okay, so um, that's all I'm going to tell you about the two-dimensional system. We've learned now quite a bit about how to stabilize the phenotype of these cells in two dimensions and how can, one can make arrays of them and screen them for, um, for biological applications, but we're interested again in the therapeutical, th therapeutic application. So if one looks at the microarchitecture of the liver, of course it is extraordinarily three-dimensional. And in the tissue engineering field, the approach to building this three-dimensional tissue has been typically to start with a three-dimensional scaffold. So here are two, two different versions of three-dimensional scaffolds that have been attempted in the literature, and then to populate these with hepatocytes. And the trouble with this approach for hepatocyte tissue engineering has typically been twofold. One, that hepatocytes don't proliferate in vitro, which is paradoxical because we know that the liver regenerates in vivo. And the second is that hepatocytes are not that migratory, so they have trouble infiltrating the interstices of these scaffolds. So we wanted to take a different approach, and that was to adapt this um, biomaterials system that was first described by Jeff Hubble. Um, it's a polyethylene glycol diacrylate system, so it's a PEG hydrogel, and it's uh, photo cross-linkable. So this is a system that a version of it is in focal, which is a pleural sealant. And, um, and so all the components are FDA approved. And essentially the way it works is you can mix cells in, you shine light, and you photo cross-link your network. What's really interesting about this system is the biomaterials community has been innovating on this platform for about the last 10 years. So we were really eager to get hepatocytes living in this system in anticipation of the fact that many different versions of this biomaterial would become available, and in fact, that's panned out. So there are now proteolytic degradable versions of these, there are adhesive versions of these, and there are versions where you can cross-link in growth factors with specific, specific release kinetics. So they're highly tunable. So um, that idea was a whole PhD thesis, and this, um, and this is uh, the culmination of the thesis, which is not rejecting that well, but this is a three-layer uh, three piece of photo-patterned liver, so hepatocytes embedded in this system that have been uh, conjugated with RGD peptide. And we've gone on now to make many, many different versions of these. So you can imagine that if you're a microfabrication person and you have a material that you can pattern with light, you start to go crazy with the kinds of structures that you could build. So these are a couple structures that we built where we pattern the cells within the material using electric fields, using a process known as dielectrophoresis. So we organize the cells within the pre-polymer, and then we show the light to freeze them in those shapes. So they don't have to be randomly organized in the three-dimensional system. They can be organized, pre-organized. 
And this is a version of the system that we call liquid tissue. So these are 300 micron microtissues. They each contain a couple hundred cells, and they can be pipetted and handled with a liquid handler. And they're made on a microfluidic system, shown here. Um, and we can make buckets of these. So in each one of these, each one of these is sort of a little microliver that one can manipulate or pack into a packed bed reactor or implant. Okay, so what are we doing with these? So um, these are the data about how these things function. This is a contact lens sized version of this. This student, Alice Chen, is about to graduate, and what she found was that in order to get hepatocytes to live in these materials, we needed to have not just hepatocytes, but also the same stromal cells that I described earlier. We needed to add adhesive peptides, so here are GDS, his ligating hepatocyte integrins, and furthermore, if one then added liver endothelial cells, so endothelial cells from the liver, in a paracrine mode, so not touching the hepatocytes, but just into the gel so that they could give paracrine signals that one could get these highly functional hepatic tissues. And furthermore, if we implant these ectopically in mice, here we have a luciferase reporter being driven by the albumin promoter. We see that they survive in vivo depending on the site. So here they are subcutaneously, and here they are intraperitoneally. And you can see in the intraperitoneal site that they persist for weeks. And if we look in the blood of the animal, we can see evidence of human serum albumin which suggests that they are recruiting vessels and getting engrafted in these intraperitoneal sites. And to look at that more thoroughly, did this experiment here. So um, these animals have been injected with a vascular resin, and you're looking at the construct here. Here it's been explanted. It's just picking it up, and you can see the vessels that have come up and into the scaffold. Here we're looking at it by micro CT. So this is a micro CT image just of the vessels in this vascular construct in the peritoneum. And here if we section this virtually and we ask how far through the construct do the vessels go, so this is a 300 micron thick or thin construct, you can see that the vessels go all the way through. So we believe that they're getting engrafted and they're hooking up to the host vasculature and producing proteins that, um, that um, go into the mice. So, that's sort of as far as we've gotten for the therapeutic application. You can imagine we have a long way to go. We have about a million hepatocytes. And clinically, we probably need at least 100 million, some would even argue a billion, for a therapeutic effect. So we wanted to think about what kind of impact one might be able to make in the short term. And we came up with this idea, which was the idea of bridging mouse models to humans by making some kind of chimeric mouse. So I showed you an example of using human systems in vitro to bridge this divide. Um, and what Alice came up with was the idea now to use these chimeric human um, mice to see if we could ask some clinically relevant question. So the question that she came up with um, is an FDA guideline known as the MIST guideline, which is the Metabolite and Safety Testing Guideline. Okay, and the way this works is that some um, compounds have human-specific metabolites, and they typically only show up in clinical trials. So the FDA guideline is that if 10% or more of the parent compound shows up as a previously unrecognized daughter compound, one has to then characterize that daughter compound in and of itself as a drug, as a chemical entity. So what Alice did then was to take these humanized mice, so these chimeric mice, and dose them orally uh, with the uh, compounds that were known to have disproportionate human metabolites, look at the pharmacokinetics of the parent compound and the metabolite compound, either in the blood or in the urine of the animals, and then calculate this ratio of the parent to the daughter. And you can see that she was able to score this disproportionate human metabolite in this mouse model. Um, uh, using the human um, ectopic artificial liver. So we're excited about this. Um, we'd like to take this further by seeing whether one can now go back and actually infect these human, humanized mice with some of the same pathogens that we described earlier, like hepatitis C and malaria. Okay, so to summarize our work on liver microenvironments, I hope I've shown you that these tiny technologies can be useful for constructing complex microenvironments, for interrogating high throughput arrays of microenvironments, and then for also studying the interaction of the microenvironments with drugs and pathogens.
And I'd like to now turn to a disease microenvironment, the cancer microenvironment. So as you well know, cancer killed um, more people worldwide um, starting in 2002 and progressing ever since than AIDS, malaria, and TB combined. This disease is changing rapidly as a large, more than half of these will be actually in the developing world in the next 10 years. I think that really changes the picture for both cancer diagnosis and therapy when one thinks about a resource poor setting. And the mainstay treatment um, for cancer are, uh, for inoperable tumors, as you know, are chemotherapy and radiation. These are limited by off-target toxicity and resistance. And one looks quantitatively at how much chemotherapy actually reaches the site of tumors. We see actually that it's less than 1% typically of the injected dose. So 99% of the injected dose is free to cause side effects. So what I'd like to show you then is our work now on probing tumor microenvironments. So in our laboratory, we construct synthetic tumor microenvironments in vitro. I'm not going to tell you about that today, but maybe next time. We construct nanomaterials that can enter into the tumor microenvironment and interrogate its proteolytic activity. I'm also not going to tell you about that. But what I am going to tell you about are nanomaterials that we deliver, that we try and uh, engineer such that they can interact with that microenvironment and hopefully treat it. So these are the data um, that I mentioned earlier. So this is just a sampling of the literature over a five-year period where folks have attempted this paradigm. And the idea is to take nanomaterials, to load them with a payload, like chemotherapy, inject it uh, into typically a mouse, but ultimately a human. And the idea is that these nanomaterials would um, deliver the payload, the chemotherapy, selectively to the tumor. And various groups have worked on the formulation of these, the decoration of these. So when these are undecorated, we call this passive targeting. And when they're decorated with ligands, we call this active targeting. And if one looks at the literature, actually, quantitatively, whether they're passively or actively targeted, at the moment we get about less than 1% injected dose. So this y-axis is actually um, a bit deceiving. The typical tumor size in these experiments is about 100 milligrams. So you can see that this is percent injected dose per gram. And actually, these numbers are all less than 1%. So we and others have been very interested in still pursuing this idea, but thinking about how to get more drug deposition selectively at the site of a disease. OK. So our approach has been to work with a collaborator, um, Erki Ruslati, who's developed a panning method, a screening method, to come up with ligands, and then to use these ligands in ways to cause more accumulation. So the screening method that he utilizes is shown here. This is known as in vivo phage display. This is um, Erki Ruslati at the burnum. And typically, in this, a system like this, about 10 to the 9th, different bacteriophage are in, introduced into a disease model. So here's a tumor-bearing animal. And what's done then is one harvests the tumor, amplifies the phage that home to that site, and repeats the process. And what's interesting about this platform as a discovery tool for a nanotechnology is that these bacteriophage are actually biological nanoparticles. They're 55 nanometers in diameter. They display 400 copies of a low affinity peptide. And essentially, what you find is that whatever peptide is expressed on the surface is the sequence that conferred homing in vivo in this model. Um, so we then identify those uh, peptide sequences. So here, what he's done is um, just fluorescently label a free peptide injected into this tumor-bearing mouse. And you can see homing here. And then you can see spillover um, of, of that into the bladder. OK, so over the years, Erki and, and uh, several other groups now have identified hundreds of peptides. The downside of this screening technique, like most of them, is that initially there's an unknown target. It can take a good five to 10 years of hard work to identify what the target is. But in spite of that, we have several favorites that I'll describe to you over the course um, of, of the rest of my talk. And what's, I think, interesting about some of them, and so for example, if you focus on this one, LIP1, what's, what's um, been surprising to us and addresses a potential limitation which we didn't know would be addressed initially, is that one could imagine that this is a very specific technology. So you're growing a xenograft of a particular patient's tumor in a mouse. And you're identifying a peptide. And one could reasonably ask the question, how generalizable is that finding going to be? 
And in fact, what Erke's group has shown is that, first of all, some of the targets, when they went back and identified them, were surprising in that they wouldn't have been identified by transcriptomic methods. So they're aberrantly expressed, but they're normal proteins. So this is a mitochondrial protein, P32, that's expressed on the cell surface. Here, this one binds cell surface nucleolin. So these are normal proteins in the wrong place, and they wouldn't have shown up using other methods. And furthermore, if one goes back then to look, for example, on human tissue microarrays, we find them, for example, this target in about 80% of human tumors. So that was a surprising and reassuring finding. So what he and I and Mike Saylor have done, uh, Mike Saylor is a nanomaterial scientist at UC San Diego over the years, is decorate many, many different kinds of materials to try and um, um, amplify the delivery of a payload to the site of disease. Okay, so this sort of summarizes what we've learned and what I'm going to tell you in the remaining part of my talk. So if one thinks about the transport of these materials into tumors, this is basically the challenge. So here's the vasculature here. Here's a tumor cell of interest in the interstitium. And we know from the work of Rakesh Jain and others that, the, that uh, there are dysfunctional lymphatics in the tumor. There's a high interstitial pressure. And once you cross the endothelial barrier, most of the transport in the tumor is by diffusion. Okay, so smaller things will diffuse better. And the endothelial barrier is the biggest barrier to entry. One thing that we've found over the years is that there's a paradoxical effect where if you take a nanomaterial and you decorate it with a targeting ligand, you actually see lower accumulation in the tumor. And the reason for that is that these, nano, these decorations can impact circulation time. So if you have less time in the vessels, you have less time to drive this driving force, and you get less accumulation. Okay? So the name of the game is to keep the circulation times long while the materials are decorated. So extend the circulation of targeted particles. That's one strategy for um, further infiltrating tumors, and I'll show you um, our approach on that now. Okay. So here we took one of a, a, a classical target, a classical charged a targeting ligand in the literature. This is a polyarginine that's derived from the HIV uh, TAP protein. It's very charged, and it, as I'll show you in a second, decreases the circulation time of nanomaterials. And we put them on magnetic nanomaterials. So these are iron oxide nanomaterials that are coated with dextran and then covered with these cell penetrating peptides that are highly charged. And what we find is that when we decorate these magnetic nanomaterials with these cell penetrating peptides, as we put more and more of them on a nanomaterial, we get uh, internalization into cells and culture by this flow cytometry plot. So the problem with this is that the circulation time of these positively charged materials is very low, and therefore they're not going to penetrate into the tumor. So one tip, classical, one obvious idea is to coat these with a passivating polymer, like polyethylene glycol. And one does that, we see that here. So here we've added about 60 polyethylene glycols to these nanomaterials, which are about 80 nanometers in size. And you can see that we passivated the surface so well that they no longer enter cells. So on the one hand, we can have a charged nanomaterial that has a bad circulation time. On the other hand, we can passivate it, but it no longer has a bioactivity. So the strategy that we came up with was to use this strategy here, which was to use a protease-triggered unveiling of the nanomaterials. So here is our new nanomaterial design. And what you see is that the passivated coating is tethered to the nanomaterial by a peptide sequence that is susceptible to protease cleavage to proteases that are specific to the tumor. So here, MMP2. So the idea is that the material is veiled, it enters into the tumor where there is protease activity, and then they get unveiled, and the bioactive functionality, the cell penetrating peptide, is now free to act. OK, so um, these are fluorescence molecular tomography images that we took with Ralph Weisleder's help at Mass General Hospital. And if you just compare here the veiled to the unveiled, you can see that we get about fourfold more accumulation using this strategy. And since they're multimodal, one can see them both by fluorescence, because we put fluorescent molecules on the dextran, as well as by MRI, because we can see there are cores. And 
If you look inside the tissue by histology, you can see that the materials are activated by endogenous levels of MMP. So not just that they're there, but that they're unveiled. The way we do that experiment is we make that tether, in this case, by an L-amino acid tether, so that it's cleavable by MMPs. And here we make a D-amino acid tether. And what we do is we have a red fluorophore on the, t the coating and a green fluorophore on the nanoparticle. So in this case, what you see is essentially that the red coating has been cleaved and diffused away. All you see is green nanoparticles. And in this case, you can see that they're co-localized. Okay. So just to summarize, unveiling occurs in the tumors at endogenous concentrations. The unveiling is specific to the cleavable peptide tether. And in our case, we get about fourfold more nanoparticles when delivered. Roger Chen's group reported last year that when he made these nanoparticles smaller, when he shrunk them from 80 nanometers down to 9 nanometers so that the clearance, the background, could be reduced, he got as much as 15-fold more delivery using this strategy. So we think this is a viable strategy in general for causing the accumulation of nanomaterials. The next idea we had for increasing how much nanomaterial payload one gets into the tumor is to just increase this concentration gradient by amplifying the deposition of nanomaterials in the perivascular or vascular space. And our idea for doing that was inspired by nature. So if one looks at nature's way of amplifying deposition of a particular cargo in a tissue, um, inflammation is a great example. So in this example, what we see is a macrophage is ingesting a microbe, it's releasing chemokines, it's activating endothelium, and that then can confer the recruitment of neutrophils and accumulation of neutrophils into this tissue. So there's sort of a separation of jobs. From here, this one is sending a signal, there's a biological amplification mechanism, and then this one is receiving the signal. So the way we use this to inspire the design of a nanomaterial system is shown here. We envision that we could have two different nanoparticles. They don't all have to be the same. A typical nanomaterial injection today would be about 10 to the 13th nanoparticles. So we envision that they might be able to have different, be different flavors. So here, you can imagine that this is what we call a signaling nanoparticle. And it doesn't have to carry any payload. It just has to find the tumor and be able to send a signal. And then the second so-called receiving nanoparticle just has to listen for the signal and carry the payload. So we sort of have taken this system apart. Furthermore, we'd like there to be an amplification from this little signal to a much bigger signal that the receiving nanoparticles could listen to. So the way we build a system like this is shown here. We used a, what did I call it? We used a signaling nanoparticle known as a gold nanorod. So I understand Jennifer West was here recently talking about gold nanoshells, and there are another class of these so-called plasmonic nanomaterials. So gold at the nanoscale, which is a metal, has electrons that are very conductive on its surface, and as a result, those inter electrons interact resonantly with light. This is a surface effect, so the shape of the surface affects the frequency at which these materials can resonantly interact with light. So what you're looking at here are gold nanomaterials. These are about 20 nanometers all the way up to 50 nanometers, and we're changing the aspect ratio. And this work was done by a Professor El Said at Georgia Tech, and what you see is that they tune their resonant frequency, the frequency at which they absorb light, from the visible all the way here into the near infrared. So what we like about these gold nanorods is that they can be heated with near infrared light, and we know that near infrared light can penetrate human tissues. So we think that they're a nice candidate for a signaling mechanism. So the way we envision constructing the system is that these would be the signaling nanoparticles. You would use some sort of host cascade to amplify the signal. So in this system, what they do is these home passively into the tumor. We shine light, and we cause local injury. The local injury actually triggers the coagulation cascade locally. This is a beautiful natural amplification mechanism with lots of host enzymatic processes. And in particular here, at the end of the cascade, is this cross-linking reaction, factor 13, which is a transglutaminase. So what we do is we then send a, a payload particle that's coated with a peptide, and that peptide is a substrate for factor 13. 
So these carry a payload and they go around the circulation and wherever the coagulation cascade has been triggered recently, they will get cross-linked into nascent clot at a high concentration. Okay? So this is how we envision this working. So you would inject the nanorods, they would passively home, then you would inject this payload and shine the light. The light would trigger the local injury and start the coagulation cascade, and these would get cross-linked into that clot. Okay, so when we do this in mice, we see these are control animals that have injected with saline, and these are animals that have been injected with nanorods. And here what we're doing is shining light on the flank of both of these animals and doing thermographic imaging, and you can see just the animals that have been injected with the nanorods are heating up in this flank. And here what we've done is inject a payload that is an imaging payload. So these are a clot-targeted fluorescent uh, nanoparticle, and you can see that they accumulate in this animal, but not in this animal. When we then go on to use a payload that carries a chemotherapeutic like doxorubicin, we see these results here. We see 40-fold more deposition of doxorubicin in the case of the nanorods and the laser than in the absence of it. Interestingly, and something that we're studying further, if you use a payload that does not carry the clot-targeting peptide, but you have heat, you also see about 20-fold more deposition of drug. And we suspect that's because heat is reducing, it's increasing the endothelial permeability, and just that actually improves the targeting of the second payload. So there's two things going on here. There's heat-based extravasation, and there's cross-linking into the clot. And the net result in the xenograph model of, um, of breast cancer is shown here. So you see if you have the same two nanoparticles, but they can't communicate, so one is coated with a control peptide that's not targeted, you see the tumors continue to grow. And here you see that tumor growth is suppressed. Okay. So we see 40-fold more drug deposition using this strategy, and we have some ideas about how one could further simplify this for translation, because you can imagine that you don't actually want to have to shine a light to trigger your cascade, right? You'd like these cascades to be autonomous or self-homing, and we have some ideas about how to accomplish that. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to give you one more example um, of uh, a method that we're using to try and increase the accumulation of a payload into the tumor. And I'm going to talk about a particular tumor t uh, cargo of interest, which is siRNA. And here what we've done is alter trans endothelial transport, this major barrier between the vascular space and the tumor interstitium. Okay, so if one thinks about siRNA, we have all the same limitations as one had before. As a candidate cargo, we have to get through the vessel, through the endothelial wall, to the target cell. Not only that, but as we know, siRNA acts by interacting with the risk complex in the cytoplasm of cells. So it's not enough to get in the vicinity of a cell, but one has to get inside the cell and out of the endosome and into the cytosol of the cell of interest if one is going to confer gene-specific silencing. Of course, we're still excited about this because by some estimates, 80% of the proteome is so-called undruggable at the moment. So as we do more and more cancer genomics, we are going to have to figure out how to silence these targets, um, or at least how to vet them in animal models, short of having, having small molecules. So this is a very active space. Many folks have been looking at this, and this is just a summary of strategies to deliver siRNA to date. So some folks have covalently modified siRNA, for example, by putting cholesterol on it. And many others had developed uh, what I'll call sort of transfection reagents, so lipid-like molecules, liposomes, polymers, et cetera. Um, and finally, some have used antibodies that target tumor endothelium. But the challenge in the field has been to get RNA silencing deep in the tumor interstitium. So again, we turn to our collaborator, Erki Rislati. And um, he had a fascinating finding, which it took him some years to un uncover. So in 2002, they first reported that some of the phage that they injected when they carried a fluorescent label could be observed extravasating into the tumor order five minutes, very quickly and at very high concentrations. And what they discovered over the course of the next eight years or so and published recency, recently in Science, Cancer Cell, and PNAS is this stimulated penetration pathway. And it works as I'll describe here in a second. So the stimulated penetration pathway works by having a cyclic peptide 
that has this motif RXXR. The cyclic peptide binds an integrin on uh, angiogenic endothelium, so alpha V beta 3. It's cleaved by an unknown protease, and the linearized form binds neuropillin 1. This activates a VEGF like VEGF-like penetration pathway. And when they uh, put this on various nanomaterial cargo, what they observe here, for example, is that the cargo penetrate rapidly into the tumor parenchyma. So we were interested in using this for siRNA delivery. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of skip the details of how we did the screen, but I'll just show you that we designed tandem peptides that had these cyclic peptide motifs on the front and endosomal escape peptides on the back. These endosomal escape peptides were also selected for their ability to non-covalently bind siRNA. So when you mix these with siRNA, you get these nanocomplexes that are about 200 to 400 nanometers in size. We screen them for their ability to uh, silence uh, genes of interest in cell culture. Okay, we showed that they were you could get specific knockdown, and I'm going to have to skip some of the details of this. Um, but and they were also specific to the receptors that they are, are supposed to bind to on the cell surface if in competition assays. And that when one put them in vivo, just as they did with the phage, one could see um, these are fluorescently labeled siRNAs. In these nanocomplexes, one could see penetration deep into the tumor parenchyma. And one could see co-localization outside of the endothelium together with the receptors that they are thought to bind. So this was very exciting to us because this means we're getting siRNA deep in the tumor parenchyma. And then we partnered with Bill Hahn at the Broad Institute, who had partnered with Joe Gray of the Cancer Genome Atlas to come up with which genes of interest to target. So they had done an in vitro RNAi screen to identify ID4 as a novel oncogene in ovarian cancer. And ID4 works by, it's an inhibitor of the DNA binding protein family. It's a novel target. It can immortalize cells in vitro. We showed using our complexes that we could knock this gene down in vitro and that cells grew slower. And then, finally, this is my last slide, um, that if we administered these nanocomplexes carrying SI against ID4 in xenografts that were growing um, orthotopically in the peritoneum of mice, um, that we saw the following results. So these are luciferized xenografts, and this is how the tumor cells normally grow in the peritoneum. These are two control conditions where we put the targeted nanocomplex with a control SI, and you can see that they still grow. An untargeted nanocomplex with the SI against the gene of interest, ID4, and the tumors still grow. But when we use the targeted tissue penetrating complex together with um, the cargo SI against ID4, we see tumor suppression. And if you look at the animals, it's more dramatic. You can see there's very little. This is the one of four, five animals where the tumor was remaining. And finally, that this conferred a survival advantage. And if one looked at the tumors, we could see that were remaining that their ID4 was silenced and there was lots of apoptosis. So, in summary, um, Mass transport in tumors limits delivery. Nanoparticle scaffolds, I believe, offer lots of um, potential to improve transport into the tumor microenvironment. And uh, nanosystems can be composed of components that cooperate. So just to summarize my whole talk, I hope I've shown you that these tiny technologies of bottom-up assembly and top-down fabrication that span this length, length right length scale from 100 microns to 100 nanometers, really provide a whole array of tools for the community to both study healthy and diseased microenvironments. And our hope is that in studying these healthy and diseased microenvironments, of course, that will ultimately impact the health of our patients and society as a whole. So thank you for your attention. for that wonderful presentation. You can see from the topic that Sangeeta cover that she
that she really builds on the bioengineering, converging it with, fit, with biology and medicine and chemistry. If you're willing, we could take five minutes for questions. Sure. Yeah, question, come to the microphone. Uh, this is regarding the issue of homing peptides or, or uh, penetrating peptides. Uh, by screening, whether that be fast library screens or other kind of screens, uh, do you expect to end up with lots of different homing peptides per cell type? Right? You know, cells with the big surface, and there are all kinds of molecules on the surface uh, to which other peptides could bind. So, do we expect to end up with lots of? Homing peptides per cell type. Um, so I guess I could answer your question in a couple ways. So if one does screening assays on several different xenografts, for example, some peptides are found to be common across cancer models, and some will be unique to the cancer cell of interest. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Congratulations for attacking the tumors with the nanoparticles. This is a, because of the innate immunity of the phagocytic systems, it was a battle, I guess, that has been going on for the last more than 50 years or so, and looks like you have made quite a few great indoors. Now, since you are dependent of the interendothelial junction for the delivery of these nanoparticles, you think certain organs might be susceptible and not others like brain because of the blood-brain barriers? And so any comment that in some place you might have good luck but not in others? So certainly that there is endothelial specification in different organs and several groups have shown in Rakesh Jain's I think is the, the most notable example that if one grows tumors in different sites, the endothelial junctions actually have different, there's different nanoparticle porosity uh, in the brain, for example, as compared to other sites. So I think that's certainly going to be the case. This tissue penetrating pathway, so far, Erke's group to, has looked at 30 different mouse models of, of cancer, 25 of them were xenografts, and five were genetically engineered mouse models, and they span most of the cancers that we all work on. So in mice at the moment, it looks to be uh, a universal finding. They're just now moving to clinical patients, it's patient samples. Thank you. So let's uh, join me in thanking mm -hmm. Sankita one more time. <laughs> you are all invited to the reception out in the atrium, and Sankita will be there as well. So.